This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. This week, we'll look at major Jewish sages, past and present. He's the author of what may well become the most read commentary on the Talmud in its history, a popularizer of the text known for his erudition. Rabbi Adin Steinzalt stopped by to speak about both his work on the Talmud and a book about a man who inspired him to much of that, the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. And for Dr. Ron Eisenberg, a side gig of sorts in digging deep into Jewish studies has yielded an encyclopedic work on essential figures in Jewish scholarship. But first, here's my interview with Rabbi Dean Steinzaltz. Your commentary on the Talmud, which has recently been translated almost entirely into English by the Karen uh, company, it's the Karen Talmud, one could estimate that within 50, 100 years, it will become the most read commentary in the history of Talmudic commentaries. I hope so. There's obviously something that you're trying to provide that's new. What is, what is it that you're trying to provide what's new with this lifelong project? I'm not trying to show off learning. Oh, 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 oh. In fact, if there is anything, and there are lots of new things in there. New things, I mean, new novel ideas, new novel, novel comment, c comments, new, 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 what they call, uh, uh, say, perushim uh, or other things. I'm trying to hide them as much as I can. I'll put it in, in the following way. I am not trying to speak instead of the Talmud. I am trying to make the, to allow the Talmud to speak it on its own. That is, that is my aim. And that idea of speaking truths that people don't like, I think there are three specific ways in which um, your commentaries on the Talmud have done that. That, uh, that on the one hand, you address multiple manuscripts and the differences between them in a way that I think a large part of the rabbinic world is, or the orthodox rabbinic world has been afraid to do. Not you afraid, it's not, it's not, uh, not avidly doing. Right, and then, and then also you've provided access to what were perhaps excised uh, portions of the Talmud yes. that at various points have been considered. Well, that, that yeah. it was mostly, mostly un-Jewish work, but at least I, I put everything, including, as I say, uh, there are some, some of those parts that I put in. in uh, like the kind of passages that deal with, for instance, like Jesus. Basically, I, I that, and, and the, say the ex, the, the use of all kinds of outside sources, I mean, scientific, uh, linguistic, uh, 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 botanical, zoological, and archaeological. That is one part of it, but that's, uh, my main part is it's, uh, how, how do I write, how do I put, put a census, a sentence of the Talmud? How much do I explain it? How much do I allow it to speak its own voice? Again, with your commentary go perhaps going to become the most read commentary in the coming 50, 100 years, a lot of the people who, that's because a lot of the people who will be reading it aren't yeshiva students, are members of other Jewish denominations and non-Jews. And this is a, a, f a fascinating development that you could, when I read your, uh, when I read the English version of the first uh, volume of this new translation of your commentary, I said, you know, you could now have a position, you could have, Anyone could read this. It's, 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 uh, the idea is, look, there's a, a beautiful story. It's, it's not in our Talmud, it's in Jerusalem Talmud, but, uh, but it's the same kind of a story. It's a story about somebody goes to the great rabbi of the, in the third century and says, Rabbi, you, to, you took my inheritance. <laughs> so he said, I don't know you. He said, he said, Murashaki Lat Yaakov. That is the, the knowledge, the Torah is the inheritance of the Jewish people. I, I demand it. So that's what I'm saying. See, they brought in the Talmud as, as an admonition to, the, to uh, all kinds of people. I'm trying to do it. So I don't want to keep, the, to keep the knowledge to myself or to a group of, 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 of people. It is, it's the inheritance that belongs to all of us. So let them, let them be able to read it. And now, exploring essential figures in Jewish scholarship with Dr. Ron Eisenberg. And what you're profiling here are, is, is the Jewish scholarship experience from basically the close of the Talmud on. And what are you trying to do when you're giving these biographies of, of literally hundreds of rabbis? Well, there's actually 375 of them. This is actually a tr uh, the third part of a trilogy. The first was based on the Bible. The second was the Talmudic rabbis. And this is everything that came after that. And the idea of all of them was there are huge numbers of people, and it's impossible to really 
be able to learn much about all of them. And so in all these three books, I've tried to take those people that I thought were the most influential, um, the most important, and try to give an idea of what they, what they believed in, how they related to Jewish history and Jewish thought over time. I mean, you said you have 375 rabbis in here. It was hard to notice explicitly who's excluded, but what are, what are some of the edge cases and, and what defines what, what gets them into a compilation like this and doesn't? Very difficult to answer that question. One thing I did do uh, by design is not to have anybody in here who is alive. The idea the same as the United States and the Israeli Postal Services, that you have to not be alive for a certain amount of years before you can get into here. It's, Just to make uh, sure you're fully not alive. Kind correct. Of, yeah. And uh, also you don't make enemies that way because if you put someone who is alive now and you didn't put another person, it could be a problem. Um, I think each case was just subjective. Uh, most of the time I think these were fairly obvious choices. And then I did get some help from my mentor and my whole doctorate experience uh, who would suggest some people that he thought were valuable to put in and several that he thought were not really as important. And uh, frequently, I, most of the time, I took his judgment. How does this speak to you? What do, what do you see as the, as the spectrum or as the, or as the trajectory for all of this rabbinic scholarship as it comes to you today? Well, again, it's very difficult because the rabbinic scholarship varies greatly depending on what area in uh, the, across the Jewish spectrum you're in. Um, Scholarship in the ultra-Orthodox world will probably stay similar to what it is now and just expanding. The modern Orthodox world um, is certainly taking whatever is available also from the general culture. Um, our daughter is studying for the Ravenet in the Aleph program, and I can see that she's taking ideas much further than, um, than other things that I've seen before but all of them are based on text. And she will take something and derive something which is quite new from the text. And it's the whole idea of how much, how much of a leeway do you have? For some, you have very little leeway. From others, you have more leeway and the opportunity to try to expand your horizons. And perhaps in a pluralistic society uh, such as we have now, it's really important that you have all of these opportunities. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable, or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast, available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable, by Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast and the on-demand menu on TV. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.